it's so good to be with you all. And I know not everyone is in the DC, Virginia area, but we are enjoying some beautiful, proper snow. And it's really a nice day to be enjoying the warmth of indoors. So I'm really excited to be with you all and to explore this topic, particularly to hear from the panelists that Carla just introduced us to. Um, and one thing that I think is really significant is to think about, Carla mentioned the upcoming movie club, which will offer a viewing of the film Many Beautiful Things, which was created by a local filmmaker in DC, Laura Waters Hinson, and tells the story of the life and work of Lilius Trotter. And I only mention this here because Lilius Trotter is gonna give us the frame for what we talk about today. And so it's helpful to have a bit of biography about her, I think, uh, to begin. So she is a woman who led an incredibly unique and interesting life. She was born in the mid 19th century in 1853 to a wealthy family in London. Her father was a stockbroker um, and her mother was a low church Anglican. So she was all very active in Protestant tradition. And from an early age, she showed talent as an artist by her early 20s, she was showing significant promise and was connected with um, the great art critic, the leading art critic of the 19th century in England, John Ruskin. Um, and she ended up being an informal student of Ruskin's over time, which is explored in the film for those of you who are able to join next week or if those of you who have seen the film before. So she studied under him for a while and he is, um, He's been said to say that if she were, he challenged her that if she were to dedicate her life to art, he thought that she could become one of the most famous female artists or the most famous female artist in England at the time, and that her work could become, in his words, immortal. And so there was a lot of angst in Lilius's life in her 20s and 30s debating really her own sense of calling. Was it to art? Was it to um missions. She was also very active within missions and serving the poor within the city of London. And she ultimately decided that she could not give herself to her art in this way, but instead at age 35 in 1888, join an informal band of missionaries to Algeria. Um, and she ended up spending the rest of her life until she died at age 75, evangelizing, serving, caring for Muslim women and children in the city of Algiers. And then later to a sect of Sunni, uh, Sunni Muslims out in the desert outside of Algiers. And yet throughout her life as a missionary, um, what's fascinating is how central a role her art played in her own life and in her own sense of anchoring and centeredness. And so while she never became an artist of great renown, she's technically a forgotten artist, um, she did keep really extensive diaries with sketches and watercolors, which you'll see throughout our time today on various slides. And what's really notable about that is that throughout her reflect throughout her paintings and drawings in these journals, she included reflections about God and about truth and about the human experience that speak really simply and winsomely to the power of beauty to help us see more clearly and to help us see more truthfully into the world. So one of the things she writes in her journals is this, come and look, these colored pages are with one and the same intent to make you see. Many things begin with seeing in this world of ours. So as we gather today, that's mostly what we wanna think about in this short hour. We're gonna um, use Lilius's example in her journals and in her reflections um, to begin next grow in wisdom, in our own ability to see rightly or see more truthfully. And so to give you a sense of this, we're going to start with just a brief clip from the film where you can start to hear a bit of Lilius's own reflections on this connection between how she sees the world and encounters beauty and then how that draws her to reflection about God. Like Ruskin, she appreciated that uh, a flower, an insect, a landscape, is all, again, part of divine creation. And by looking at it, and especially by drawing at it, one comes to understand it more. It's looking at the world with such intensity that you not only see how beautifully and precisely it's made, if you like the scientific view of nature, but you also uh, begin to see the meaning that it has for you in terms of your own personal spirit, your soul, 
by virtue of the intensity with which you experience it. The true ideal flower is the one that uses its gifts as a means to an end. The brightness and sweetness are not for its own glory. They are but to attract the bees and the butterflies that will fertilize and make it fruitful. For it is more blessed to give than to receive. So you can see in that brief clip a sense both of what the film is like about her life, but also this unique style of reflection that Lilius has of being able to encounter, encounter the flower and receive the flower, but then come to this conclusion that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so as we hear from our panelists today, this is what we wanna be thinking about. How does beauty help us to grow in wisdom? How does it help us to see, to see God more clearly, ourselves more accurately, the world more as it really is? And so I'm going to ask our panelists two questions. One is more conceptual. One is more practical. Um, and we would love to have you post questions in the chat as we go. Carla mentioned that. We'll also have a few moments where I'll invite you all to maybe respond or, or offer some feedback in the chat if there's something that's really resonant with you or something that you um, really want to explore more. And so now I'm going to turn to our panelists, um, hoping that they're ready, and ask this first question. So what we hear from Lilius is she's inviting us to come and look to um, encounter her colored pages with one and the same intent to make you see. Many things begin with seeing in this world of ours. So as you reflect on this invitation and the knowledge that Lilius is connecting seeing with understanding, what is it that stands out to you or especially connects for you given your own practice? I'm gonna start with Christy. Um, Christy, in your own practice as a visual artist, how does this practice of seeing deepen or expand or change your own understanding of faith? Thanks, Kate. Uh, <clears throat> it's such an honor to be here with you all today. Um, and unlike Lilius, I'm really grateful that I did not have to choose between being an artist and missions. And I'm grateful I have uh, the unique ability to, to blend a bit of the, of the two of them. So I think it's so fitting that we're talking about beauty now at the start of Lent in the bleakest month for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, the bleakest day in fact for us here in Charlottesville, it's sleeting and freezing and icy, um, unlike Northern Virginia, I guess, um, and a year into the darkness of a global pandemic, not to mention the many other griefs and losses that we're each bringing into this space. So first, I wanna say that seeing beauty amidst the dark and the pain is exactly where we should be starting as that's at the center of our faith. We could say the cross and resurrection are the epitome of beauty. So looking for beauty, I think is an act of hope and it's my starting place as an artist. And for me as a visual artist, it begins with paying attention. I've recently participated in these two online workshops. It's a silver lining of the pandemic um, with these wonderful abstract artists. And both were emphasizing that good paintings must have some key elements to them. First, they must have good design. They need to hold together and have balance or unity, yet also tension. So think of the three in oneness of the Trinity. In fact, in art, we have the rule of thirds. So maybe there's some parallel between that and our Trinitarian faith. And then good paintings need to have lots of interesting contrasts, dark and light, thick lines to thin lines, hard and soft edges, opaque and transparent sections. The more of this you have, though not too much, as you also need some harmony, the stronger the painting will be. And so as I've grown as a painter, I've paid attention to these elements more and more, and my love for painting has only increased. It's incredible to look deeper into the landscape, for example, really stare at it and start to see all of these subtle nuances. And I see these same principles at play in my work with students and communities, and perhaps why I've so loved bringing diverse groups of people together. The contrast yet possibilities for connection among people to me are like making a striking painting. And I'm sure you all could find examples of this creative seeing in your own lives and work. 
how once you really pay attention to something, these beautiful subtleties emerge and you begin to play with them and pair things together in unexpected but powerful ways that often can bring beauty out of really disparate or difficult or even heartbreaking situations. So I want to share a painting as an illustration that's appropriate during this Lenten season. Um, I think Drew is gonna cue that up for you. It's called Ashes by Anne Grebe from 1992. <clears throat> and note that this is a large painting. It's about 60 by 80 inches. So it would take up a lot of space if you were in front of it. I think abstract art, even though I'm not an abstract artist necessarily, it can help us with this connection between seeing and understanding because it brings into stark relief how we can't understand it with our rational, logical minds. It's kind of a mystery, like our faith. Making sense of it comes mostly with a different kind of understanding that involves our emotions and senses and spiritual mind, you could say. And here's what Sister Wendy Beckett, a nun from the UK, writes about this painting in her book, The Gaze of Love, Meditations on Art. And I was so delighted to find that Corporal folks also really love Sister Wendy Beckett. So this is a bit of a, a long quote with some quotes within a quote and just pay attention to the ideas. So this is what Sister Beckett writes. A painting like Anne Grebe's Ashes will not let us pigeonhole it away from our consciousness. We are forced by its strangeness to come to some sort of terms, to try to let it open up within us and communicate. Its passionate beauty with that richly colored central shape pulsing with blood red significance makes us want to understand. Yet the answers are clearly not verbal. The artist Grebe says that she is, quote, trying to reveal living connections without so much of my own intervention. No juxtapositions, ambiguities, no clues, just things. And she quotes William Blake's famous line about the doors of perception. If they were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. Blake believed that we have shut ourselves up so that we can only see all things through narrow chinks in our imprisoning cavern. This cleansing of the doors of perception requires great vigilance. We must wholeheartedly desire it. And Grebe speaks of not making do with any of our conditionings, which succeed in limiting us daily to the containment of the world. Ashes is an artist's attempt to escape that containment, writes Beckett, to clear the debris from the eyes of the spirit so that we may see the infinite in the ordinary. Hmm. So in closing, I just, I was thinking of the phrase adapted from scripture in the popular worship song um, that's really fitting to this, that open the eyes of my heart, Lord, I want to see you. And I think that with art, as we peel away the narrow chinks of our imprisoning caverns, as Blake said, we can, Lord willing, catch glimpses of the infinite, often like children do. Thank you. I love that, Christy. And I'm putting in the chat because it's link. Sister Wendy Beckett has a great book, um, the Art of Lent, which I was going to share with you anyway, not knowing that Christy was talking about Sister Wendy Beckett. So I just put a link to that book if any of you are, are drawn to look at visual art um, as part of your Lenten meditations. All right, Karen, can you share with us, um, can you share with us in your own practice as a storyteller and as um, you practice very much the art of hospitality, um, what are the ways that you see this connecting for you, this idea of seeing? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's such an honor for me to be here with um, the, the real, I think of you all as the real creatives, the visual artists, the filmmakers. You know, for me, um, I am a storyteller in that um, I gather with undergraduates, with students at the University of Virginia often, and I'm so aware of their, the urgency of their questions. You know, they're trying to figure out what their calling is, what their purpose is, about their relationships. And so a lot of the questions, of course, they look to themselves first. Um, they look within themselves for answers, um, but, but they and we are all so limited when we only have the perspective of, of our own wisdom and our, our own insight. You know, we only have our own experience, our own perspective, our own personalities, our, the limits of our faith, um, and so I think for me as a storyteller, which I, I think, I guess is what I am um, with students is the invitation to them and to all of us is to look out, um, to look at the stories of other lives, um, to look to others uh, who might be exemplars, who are mentors, who just had 
a different experience in the world. Maybe they come from a different cultural background, another century, another location, another um, experience. And so for me, the idea of seeing and storytelling is taking that position of curiosity, of uh, looking from a distance, looking forward, looking backward at lives, at stories. Um, and there's one advantage where you can sort of hear the story and take a little of the emotion out of it. Like your own anxiety is sort of put aside and you have the relief of looking at someone else's problems or lives or struggles. Um, and I was thinking um, in, as I was reflecting on this idea of seeing um, of a study that um, the new school did on the benefits of reading literary nonfiction and literary fiction. Um, reading really good fiction, reading really good stories. And they found that this, in fact, um, this practice is a practice of developing empathy. So that hearing and reading a really good story, richly told, is an exercise in emotional intelligence. Uh, mm -hmm. It uh, develops our social perception, our sensitivity to emotional nuance and complexity. Um, mm -hmm. So I love that scientists have found that, in fact, turning our view in a way um, to other stories and other lives does develop that that depth in our own lives. Um, and so I think for me, I've seen the benefits of that in that I personally uh, and in conversation see my faith develop when I see the broad diversity of ways and people who have followed God. Um, people unlike me, but people like me. So there's a, an element of freedom. There's an element of diversity. There's an element of grace because you see that God works truly in all these amazing ways. And Lilius Trotter is one story that I, that I love to tell. And, and the, the young people are really affected by her story and her life because of course she was their age when she made these incredible decisions um, to move to Africa, not knowing any Arabic, you know, just moving in. She didn't even make it through the, the mission society uh, requirements. So she and two other women just got on a boat and went um, without the benefit of, of that. So I just, her daring, her story um, has been a great way, I, I think of, for all of us, of seeing what it looks like to be a person of faith and, and of courage. Thank you so much, Karen. And I love, um, I was scrambling around listening when you mentioned this new school article because it reminded me of this from Pitchfork. Have you all read this article from Pitchfork on the, the benefits of listening to new music? So there's all sorts of fun ways that, and I, I found it, I'm so excited. Yay. Um, but it's another cool way. I mean, what you're sharing from the new school and then what this offers in Pitchfork is really getting back to Christie's idea of opening, you know, peeling away the things that confine us and finding new ways to just as a discipline open our, our perception and our senses to new things to explore. Um, we don't have Charlie, but hopefully she'll come back in a moment um, and show, oh, there she is. Okay, sure. Charlie, can you unmute and um, share with us um, just in your own practice as an artist, um, how you see this practice of seeing or Lilius's practice of seeing connecting to your work? Yeah, so um, actually I can also piggyback off of what Karen was saying. There's so many things that I think will run through what all of us have to say, but yeah, so I, so the goal of an artist generally, whether you're painting, writing, making a film, poetry, whatever, is always to make people see something in a new way. And I think um, the challenge is, so the brain has a way of, 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 of simplifying complex reality by filling in the blanks or the details of what we see in passing with what we expect to see. Right, and so the challenge of the artist that I've always found when I'm, I'm, I'm creating and I'm wanting to communicate something is to um, bypass this inclination we have to fill in with what we already expect to see and actually get something else out of it. And so, and it makes me think of how, um, you know, in our scrolling culture that we go through social media and we just keep going and I do it, you know, and I click click the heart, oh, that looks cute, but we don't really take things in. And I remember in church, um, the eyes being referred to as the eye gate a long time ago. I don't know if people still say that. Um, but when you think about it, the eyes really are a gate. And 
Um, but not everything comes in the gate that we see. A lot of it is just driving by, <laughs> driving by the gate. But the things that come into our eye gate that we really take in are the things that we engage in and that become a part of us. Um, so I think what we're always trying to do as artists is to draw the audience into a subject or a detail in a way that extends the engagement with that detail or with that subject long enough for the the subject to actually become a part of them in a more psychic sense. And so, um, and actually I thought of another artist who I, I love to reference in, in this type of thing is Georgia O'Keeffe. She said, Georgia O'Keeffe did those wonderful studies of like flowers and fruit and she would like zone in on some part of it that we don't normally focus on. And she said, nobody sees a flower really. It's so small, it takes time. And we haven't time and to see takes time, like to have a friend takes time. So um, as an artist and more importantly, as a worshiper, taking the time to really see things that are mundane or ordinary um, invites things into the gate. And it has been incredibly important for me as a habit and a practice and a discipline. So four, four occasions came to mind when that's been important in, crea in creating and worship. Um, I went to the Rodin Museum when I was in college in, in Paris and they had the, the two statues that jumped out of me at me, and I think they were replicas, but still they were exact replicas of the statue of David and the thinker. And I remember seeing these statues in textbooks and being like, oh, that's cool. You know, not really engaged. And when I saw them in person though, I mean, I literally was just like stuck to the ground, like, wow, this is so amazing. And I remember just looking at all of the, the different, you know, the muscle, like, I mean, they captured everything, you know, and I remember that leading me to worship because at first I was impressed with the artist. And then I thought, but oh, God did that. God did that. Like he made all of that stuff. They're copying it and God breathed life into it. And this is made out of stone. God made it out of dirt. God made the dirt that he, I mean, it ju I just went into a whole thing. And I remember um, being surprised at the time that that looking at art. Um, that wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily gospel art, you know, but I'm saying it made me, it led me to worship. Um, and also, um, recently, I'm going to skip one because I don't want to take up too much time. Reading a daughter to my book about the life cycle of a flower um, really inspired my most recent poetry series, which um, we, there's a link to that. So I don't know if it's in the comments, <laughs> but um, it, it's about a poetry series about dandelions and butterflies. And I did recently upload a lyric video of one of the poems to um, my website, which I don't have time to get into all of them right now. Um, but the la one of the last lines in the poem is, I want to die like a flower. And I came to that because I was at the time just thinking about, um, I was contemplating the aging process. I was contemplating what that means for women, especially because I'm, I'm into glamour and beauty and all of that stuff. And I was just thinking about how in our society, women can tend to feel like we're losing value um, as we're aging in particular. And um, I remember the only thing I had on that at the time and was a scripture in Isaiah, Isaiah 48, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And it, that's appropriately humbling. And it, I mean, it's definitely a reasonable meditation, but it didn't make me feel great about getting older or anything, you know, um, but I reading this book, which caused me to look at flowers in a way that I'd never, I'd never considered the life cycle of a flower. I just look at flowers in passing and I think they look nice and they smell nice. Um, but the thing that, that really got my attention was that flowers seed at the end of life and that as they're fading, they're leaving the seeds of life behind. And I mean, I, it just, it led to a whole poetry series. And I just remember thinking, wow, what a gift that God has given us in this, in the fading um, is that it's not in vain. It's not a thing that's just, it's not a loss that as we are fading, we can be leaving something behind and, and I got that from considering I mean I got a tattoo of a dandelion and everything like I really like <laughs> um and finally and this is part where I'll talk a little bit about my film when I was standing at the Smithsonian and actually Drew you can cue up the 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 little reel so I was standing at the Smithsonian Museum and um the the National Museum of African American History and I was um watching I was I was stuck at the exhibit where they had the slave sales 
So the slave sale exhibit has, um, if any, anyone hasn't been there, they have an actual block that they used to have people stand on when they were auctioning them. And then they had all of these um, advertisements for selling people and they had um, bills of sale and all of these descriptions about who was being sold and what they were what was paid and I remember um, being absolutely struck by how many young women and babies were being sold how many families were separated and as a mother you know everything once you become a mother like everything is through that lens and I just remember I had been through the middle passage exhibit and thought maybe I could have survived that I don't know uh, maybe right and I, been, I had been to the whipping block and I thought I don't know, I don't know, maybe I could have survived that. Maybe, I don't know, I'm still in awe. I, I had been um, past an exhibit that talked about all the sexual assault and I thought, I don't know, I don't know, people survive. I could not imagine these women surviving their children being ripped from their arms. And so I stayed there because I had to make sense of how am I here? Like how were there generations after generation of women who kept living, kept giving birth, kept nurturing, kept working until I could be here today, living a different life. How did that happen? How did they not just all give up and die? And because I've, I, that was the part that I couldn't imagine surviving. And I remember this is where my film was birthed. The, the character from my film was birthed in my mind. She was conceived in that moment because I had to imagine a woman who found a reason to live in the midst of all of this. And at the end of the day, they had to cling to something. They had to find a focus outside of the pain in spite of their trauma that made them continue to hope. Um, and they didn't have luxuries. So they had to find hope in mundane things. And so this is where the themes in my film of faith, family, and community come through because what were they looking at? You know, what were they focusing on that made them believe that they were seen by God, that made them trust that they would be delivered, that made them have a reason to have a hope for their children. And, 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 and so that I had to put that into the film because I'm making another slave story. We've seen a million of them. Um, there's always the elements of, of, of the physical violence, the family separation, the, the sexual violence, that's always in there. But if I'm going to make that film in 2018, 19, what am I doing that's going to make people see something else? Because I don't want people just to come away feeling traumatized. I'm tired of seeing Black trauma. <laughs> like, I need it to be redemptive or thanks, but I'm quite familiar. Thank you very much. Um, so what was I going to offer to make the pain and the trauma redemptive was that people had to be able to find something beautiful in the pain and in the trauma because and they had to be able to come away saying, that's how they did it. That's what they saw that made them keep going. And so as an artist, I had to make choices about how I filmed trauma and what kind of redemptive element would be in focus. Um, and that was very hard, but it was also, it was also a spiritual contemplation for me because I, ha I mean, listen, far lesser things make me not want to get out of bed in the morning. You know what I mean? So, and I, I have to draw from that example of the faith of my ancestors sometimes to say, okay, listen, if, if they can find something to cling to, something beautiful and something to hope in in the midst of that experience, then surely you know the same God. You know what I mean? And so I, I think that even when it comes to looking at things that are, are not beautiful, I think it's this, we're doing the same thing as when we look at something extraordinarily beautiful, which is we're trying to find something we can relate to that is ordinary, that somehow makes that thing beautiful or makes that, that pain livable, or we're finding some element that we can, as very ordinary people, knowing ourselves to be ordinary, knowing ourselves to be flawed, something that reminds us of ourself so that we can see ourselves in the grand scheme of things as being seen, being an intentional part of God's plan um, and, and, and finding value in every 
sovereign choice that he has made for our lives and how he has made us. So that that's, I mean, I feel like I went on and on, but. <laughs> it, it was all good things that we needed to hear. I love so much of what you said, Charlie, about seeing ourselves as being seen is a really deep, I mean, there's so many things that you've shared with us that I think are so important. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think the last thing that I wanted to say too, um, that I really wanted to emphasize is that when we do see um, something beautiful in the mundane and in the ordinary and in and, and the simple, like I feel like what it does for me is it makes me think of how us and our finiteness and our imperfections somehow figure significantly into God's perfect eternal plan and like how his grace makes a way for dust to be welcome in the midst of his magnificence and like what kind of goodness makes that possible. And, and I think that that is what we get from taking time with something to, to bring it down to its most ordinary basic elements and realizing like how those things come together to make something beautiful and powerful. Well, I do encourage you all to go to Charlie's website, which is in the chat and, and see the, uh, see the whole film if you can, but certainly there's a trailer there as well. Um, it's only 36 minutes long, so you, maybe on a lunch break. <laughs> you can watch it. Um, so we've heard some rich things already, and what I'd love to do is give us a little bit of a bridge here and listen again to one of the little lessons that Lilius herself talks about in one of her journal entries that's featured in the film. Um, and this is a lesson she says she took from a bumblebee. So as you're listening and just sort of absorbing everything Charlie's shared, everything Karen has shared, everything Christy has shared, um, listen also to this voice of Lilius. And if you have a response you wanna share in the chat, feel free to do that or, or a comment or a question. We'd love to hear from you there as well. The longer she was in North Africa, I think the more she began to think in parable. She writes, A bee, a bee comforted, comforted me very much this morning, concerning the desultriness that troubles me and our work. He was hovering among some blackberry sprays, just touching the flowers here and there. Yet all unconsciously, life, life, life was left behind. So you can see the echo in Lilius that we're hearing from many others as well, which is what can we take away from seeing the sculpture at the Rodin Museum, from seeing the bumblebee on the flower, from seeing the snow in the yard, whatever it is that we're encountering, how can we start to have that open up for us into a deeper truth? Um, I laugh because I was listening to that um, film and my six-year-old son was around and all night afterwards he kept saying life 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 is left behind you know this was like his little his little sort of takeaway that he his mimicry um so i'd love to close uh not close but just ask you all one last question which is much more of just a practical question as you think about um how how you engage this in really concrete ways because i think it's very easy for any one of us to think oh well you're a professional artist or these other people do this amazing work and lilius is a missionary in algeria and of course they have these profound insights um, and it can be really easy to feel like this is a practice that's very other or that it's only for particular people and so what i'd love for you all to reflect on is we see in lilius that she's using her drawing she's using her daily journals um, as a way to engage this practice. And in your own life, I'd love for you all to share just one really practical way. Um, maybe it's a habit or something as simple as a permission you've given yourself or a posture that you try to maintain. Um, anything really that comes to mind that's helped you learn to see better and engage with beauty as a, as a pathway or a gateway into wisdom. 
So I'd love if you can share a really specific example. It does not have to relate to your creative life. It could just have to do with any part of your life. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Karen first if you'll if you'll share with us. Thank you. Yes, I was so charmed and fascinated by Lilius Trotter's practice. Um, well, just based in her own situation, um, because I tend to think of practices and of the spiritual life as these grand endeavors, you know, that take a lot of time and a lot of preparation and a lot of commitment. And she was fully committed, but in her painting, she kept her tools simple and she kept them close. So we know from her biography that as a missionary, she did not have the luxury of large canvases and a studio, you know, uh, uh, boxes of paints and brushes, but she always kept with her on the fly, wherever she went with children in the Kasbah, in the desert, the bare minimum of equipment. So she had a small brush or a pencil, she had a few paints, and she had these tiny four by six sketchbooks or even two inch square spaces in her journals where she would, she would paint. And so some of her paintings, although they look large are on this uh, a space of canvas that is the size of a matchbook. And so um, for me, what that tells me is, you know, to, to practice my spiritual life, you know, it doesn't have to be when I, set aside all this wonderful time to meditate or pray, but it can be on the fly. So what I do when I'm thinking about are, are my tools, you know, what is the tool that I can keep close to me in my pocket so that when I have that moment um, to pay attention um, to worship, it's there. So for me, of course, my phone is always in my pocket. Um, and so my habit has been as Christie's to listen to Pray As You Go, which is a, a podcast from the Irish Jesuits. Uh, and pray as you go, I listen to it every morning when I'm making my coffee um, and, and you know, I'm sort of bustling around in the kitchen. So it's right there, it's easy, it's happening while I'm cleaning the kitchen. So I love that tool. Um, there's another um, devotional called Know Your Mothers, it's an app. Um, so it's, it's just right there. So I find that I tend to do these little habits because they're there, they're small and they're, they're right at hand. And for Lilius, I love her perspective. She says that God wants to show us that nothing is great or small to him. Such a day of small things still, she says, but on God's time, and that is enough. Size, as well as times and space, count nothing to him. So again, just giving grace and validity and value to those small gestures throughout the day, um, whenever and wherever we can. Um, turn to the spirit and turn to prayer. Thank you so much, Karen. Charlie, can you share a practice or a specific example of how you do this in your life? Yeah, I, you know, to be honest with you, I definitely don't have the of, of time and a lot of stillness. <laughs> um, but I, I have found that it's really quite impossible for me, just the way my brain works, to really do some seeing without silence. And so it's just been my commitment to make it happen. Um, and, and that is a challenge, I understand, especially with we're team quarantine all the way over here. So <laughs> everybody's in the house. None of us like the cold, no leaves if we don't have to. It's a lot. But I mean, if I have to get up a little early, stay up a little late, whenever I catch some silence, listen, I have totally taken the bounds off of screen time. My daughter, she's getting a lot of screen time, you know, because I need the silence. Um, and so I would say just not, don't feel guilty about making some cuts in some other places to make room silence in life. Um, and I think that that's probably the biggest challenge. Sometimes it's feeling guilty about giving yourself the time for these kinds of practices. And But it's necessary. You need it. It's healthy. You'll come back and more able to whatever's left to do afterwards. But so that's been my thing. And, I, and I'm saying this as someone for whom I'm having to make sacrifices to get that silence. I understand. I'm having to, you know, relax on the restrictions I'm having to stood sometimes or get up a little earlier than I want to but 
I, I think the silence is that important. Um, and, and, and that's just the way the brain works, right, in general, like, senses are activated, activate other senses. So if I want to see, if I want to let something in the eye gate, I just have to quiet things down around me, so. Mm -hmm. so. I love that, the idea of quieting the other senses, senses to see more clearly. Christy, what would you share with us, a specific practice? Um, yeah, well, first I wanna say that, um, Charlie, the O'Keefe quote you mentioned just was spot on for me about that idea that, that seeing beauty takes time and that it's immersed in the ordinary, like the flower or the bumblebee, um, and that it, is, it needs to be able to be present and true and speak into those darkest of places, whether it's the auction block. Um, or elsewhere. Um, and I love the definition of contemplation, this idea of a long loving look, um, which involves sustained attention. And I think sometimes, you know, the love doesn't necessarily come first. Sometimes you just have to pay attention to something and you fall in love with it, right? And then other times yeah. you're in love with something, you, you pay attention and then you get to love it more truly and honestly as you come to really see, you know, it or that person in your life more truly. Um, but so I love the idea of habits. Um, Karen knows this and probably Kate too. Um, I always tell my students the Annie Dillard quote of how we spend our days is in fact how we spend our lives. Um, so I'm big into the idea of, you know, whatever these practices are, are going to shape who we are. So if, if we want to be people who see um, and who take long loving looks, um, we need to think of how to build that into our daily lives as best as we can. Um, so for, for an artist, I do have a studio practice um, three days a week where I'm in the studio and I'm grateful my kids are now old enough to give me that space. My, our youngest um, is nine. Um, but I, even more than that practice, I would say that it's a posture of, um, of being utterly curious about the world around me. Um, I go outside into nature every day, um, either for a run or a walk. Um, and I think of, you know, the poet Mary Oliver or Annie Dillard and just their astonishment at, at the world and how amazing it is. And my mother-in-law, who's on this, I think I saw you on there. Um, I feel like she models this too, but um, it's just amazing. And I, I carry my phone when I run and walk as well. Um, so I can take photos for references for my paintings later on. But, um, you know, I've never eaten psychedelic mushrooms, but I swear, like when this sort of curiosity wells up inside me, I feel like this veil has been taken off about the creative world. And I'm just looking around like, I mean, are you kidding me? Like, have you seen, have you seen this? And that is the impulse. I feel like that is undergirds my paintings of just wanting to point out and just draw notice to this amazing thing that we are a part of. I love that. I'm thinking of this day that I, um, I like that you brought psychedelic mushrooms into the conversation. First of all, I love that. Um, <laughs> I came out of class one time when I was in my master's program and a pileated woodpecker had tragically struck the side of the building and was on the ground, you know, is this dead bird? And I stopped in my tracks and everything in me thought I need to keep it. Like I need, I want, I want the bird. You know, I want to like hold it and cradle. It was stunning. And afterwards, I confessed to my friend, you know, I had this weird moment where I, I really seriously thought for a too long period of time about taking the dead bird with me. And you know, she's my best friend because she, she said, you should have. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I love that idea of just wonder and, and being able to see. I think the other theme that has come out so much in this conversation is beauty opens to the, the truth of how things are. And so it's no surprise that we're touching on science, we're touching on research, we're touching on the natural world. So Charlie, when you talk about dying like a flower, understanding life cycles, um, when Lilius is watching the process of pollinate, pollination, you know, I mean that all of this, you start to see a real wholeness and an integration and a beauty within that. Um, the unity you talked about, Christy, of a good painting, it holds together the integrity of the design. So I think it's also so encouraging for us when we're thinking of the topic of beauty, it's easy to think that's for the artists or for the designers. And I think it's really important to remember that it's for all of us, you know, whatever it is, whatever eyes we come with, we can see. Um, 
Yes, and Carla's clarifying that we do not, Coracle does not endorse um, uh, <laughs> endorse mushroom use. So I'd love, I don't see, um, I'm trying to see if there's any questions. Carla, have you grabbed any questions from the chat that I might be missing? I'd love to have a few minutes before we close um, to just address, and maybe you all can take a minute, those who are listening, if you have something you'd like to share in the chat that you'd like to ask one of our panelists or a comment you'd like to share, something that stood out to you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's part two of Bill's question. It's the only question that I've seen so far, but um, can seeing become second nature is an interesting, mm -hmm. like can seeing be become a part of just how we see the world or yeah, that's an interesting, I, that's a, an interesting thing that I'd love to hear our panelists respond to. Great. Anybody want to take it? <laughs> Um, I'll just say that it's just like anything else with practice, it becomes a habit, it becomes a way of life. You're basically sharpening. It's, you know, just like if you, 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 you use a muscle, you exercise it, you build it up, it, it, it stays with you. And, and if you let, if you neglect it, you just, I think it, it absolutely becomes a way of life when you make it an intentional practice. Yeah. Anybody else? I would just add, I think because we are such creatures of wanting to be productive that um, maybe you can trick yourself. I mean, for me as an artist, because I am, it's part of my vocation and I'm getting paid to paint paintings. I have this impulse, I, like a need to every day be paying attention to the, the landscape around me. but. Um, you know, perhaps you just need to encourage yourself that I'm going to be sketching or I'm going to be writing a poem or, you know, creating this thing, something that will maybe just force yourself into the habit um, to feel like you're, you're producing something and, and maybe you need to tell a friend or a spouse or a, a child that, that you mm -hmm. want to do this for them. Um, that will maybe just give that extra fire under you to actually do that. Christy, I'm really i um, happy that you said what you just said because I was looking last night at a reproduction of a Lilius painting and it was some sketches, some little watercolors of some people. And there was a young woman and she had written the word Alicia. So she knew the woman's name, which I thought was so beautiful. And in pencil, you can hardly see it. Lilius has written, time is not money. I just wondered what she was thinking when she did that. So I could just imagine her, you know, in the slum of Algiers, looking at these women, these children, you know, who have come by um, and she's taking the time to see them and to see them well, because she's painting them and she's naming them. And then that time is not money. You know, we think about all that she gave up um, to live as she did. Um, so I don't know, again, I think the smallness of the gesture and, for her, it was a habit because I think she loved these people um, and, and she loved the world and she loved the sunset. And so the seeing and the loving, as you said, it sort of, it just one reinforced the other. Yeah, I would say that the reinforcing is, is definitely what I was thinking, like it's extreme because the payout is rich. You really make a habit of seeing and contemplating um, you want to keep doing it. Um, I mean, I will never look at a flower the same way. It's, I, I love the fact that I enjoy more because I see flowers differently. So it has been something that makes it worth it for me to continue the practice. So I, I don't think it's something that you even have to think about whether or not it will become a habit. It will be because the, the payout will keep you coming back. Mm -hmm. I just would add to, I think for people who are actually getting paid for their creative ha habits and practices that there, there's a warning to not let it become driven by that. And so I think I know talking to a lot of other artists, you know, having to keep space for that just playful delight, um, wonder where you're just playing and it's not driven um, by the profit or the work. Mm -hmm. That's so wonderful. We have, I think one last um, slide that really is to take this idea of practices and share them with you all who have joined us on the call. Um, and it is perhaps helpful that this panel is happening during Lent because many of us are in a posture of giving up or taking up or open to trying new things than 
perhaps we otherwise would. Um, and so two things, two invitations we wanted to share with you all or practices you might consider taking up would be to just think about where you regularly encounter or engage with beauty. Um, that might be in your house, it might be in your yard, it might be, as Christy said, in your neighborhood going out for a walk. Um, it may be that you grew up by the sea and going to the ocean is a special place. Um, but consider carving out a few minutes if it's accessible today or tomorrow and meet with the Lord there and invite him to help you see what he has for you in that space. Just help him to open your eyes to the beauty of that space and yourself within it. And the second invitation would be much closer to something that Lilius invites us into through her journals, which is to choose something from nature or Georgia O'Keeffe, as Charlie has said, choose something from nature, a leaf, a bird, a tree, a flower, and set aside at least two minutes to just watch it and be with it and notice what it is that you notice. See if that watchfulness yields any kind of insight or word um, for you. It, it may or may not on the first try, but um, you don't have to give up on it. You can, you can come back to it again. Um, and think about that. So those are two practices we wanted to encourage you all to think about. And then where we wanted to leave is to give you a painting of Lilius's. And one of the things she does, she often, I don't know that we've seen a real concrete example of this in her work, but she would often have these paintings and then she would write in script on the paintings themselves. Um, some sort of meditation or reflection or insight that she received from being with that painting. And so we thought it might be nice to give you all this image from Lilius Trotter and to say, let's take a moment and meditate on this painting. What are things that you notice? How might you caption or what are some words that might accompany this image? And we also have a link to this uh, rec This is in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. And so there's a link there where here on the call, you might not be able to um, find the stillness you need to really think about it, but we'd encourage you to sit with this painting or something like it and think about what you notice. Carla, do you wanna close us out here? Sure, I'd be happy to. So thank you all so, so much for being with us. Thank you to our moder um, moderator. Thank you to our panelists. You guys were wonderful. Such a rich discussion today. And thank you again for all of our partners who made this possible. So I hope you all have a wonderful day and we're so grateful for you being with us.